Ok. Good morning, Cedar Rapids! Hey, salutations. Uh, um, okay. Brothers, let us all unite! You would rather have us keep the internet than have peace in the world. Like, no, I gotta have my... I gotta have my internet. Live in front of an internet audience. Live from New York. Not really. It's the I'm Clifford Today show. It's a me. Sonic the Hedgehog. Welcome, everyone. Well, so far, it's a, a lot smoother start than last time. Can I get an amen? New episode, new me. So, uh, yeah, so intro music by John Bartman, johnbartman.com. And, uh, yeah, we're going to get into some interesting stuff today. I mean, that's that's always the case, right? I always got something interesting for you guys. So fingers crossed that today runs a lot smoother than, you know, and in fact, the last couple times, the last couple time haven't, times haven't really been that smooth. Um, today we are joined by Babel, the Grammy, uh, Grammy award-winning album Babel by Mumford and Sons. No, it's not Babel because Marcus says Babel in in the album, even though everyone else has always said Babel, usually. I don't know. Maybe it's a British thing. Uh, so, yeah. Let's just get right to it. We're going to talk about Levi the Poet today, and I'll get more into that. You know, I'm trying to think. Um, merch. Don't forget that there's merch. Link in the description. Merch if you want some some stuff with my with my name on it and uh yeah if any of you are out there uh feel free to give a shout out uh, to, to sound off in the chats um but uh yeah so this is like the first normal episode of the i'm clifford today show been uh doing the we finally got through the the top tens the top 10 lists and uh, you guys have been very, uh, um, very awesome about that. Uh, I've been getting a lot of good feedback about that. So really appreciate it. Speaking of which, have some housekeeping to do. Last episode, our friend uh, Thomas Stokes, uh, 90, Thomas Stokes 9412 left a comment and he left it on the last episode as well. And Thomas says, thank you for engaging with my comment on the last episode. Yeah, no problem. By the way, if you guys like want a chance to, to, to have your name and your comment read and interacted with on the show, just, yeah. Best way to do that is to leave a comment on, on the video. Also, Leave a review if for any of you uh, audio listeners, on if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, leave a review on the show, and we'll also read that as well. But uh, Thomas has left his, uh, so yeah, he, he continues. I also like a lot of the songs you mentioned in this list. I consume Christian music through Spotify, so as a result, I can't tell if a song is only popular on Spotify or if it is popular on other platforms as well. Well, Thomas, I mean, I have to do my research. Uh, I actually watch this YouTube channel. I always forget their name, but they they post they post videos every week of what is like in the charts currently. So that's how I stay on track. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't care. <laughs> so. So, uh, so yeah, I wonder what the Spotify algorithms are like. Here are some other Christian songs which were popular on Spotify that I personally liked. So, uh, Thomas has got a whole list here, and I guess I'll I'll just give my thoughts 
on them if I if I know them. Fake It by Torin Wells and Aaron Cole. This song is a guilty pleasure of mine. There's not much substance to the lyrics, but the song slaps. That's cool. I had an episode about Torin Wells and uh, a little while ago last year, and I have my problems with him. And his music isn't really my thing, but I don't hate it. You know, I guess he's kind of like the Bruno Mars of Christian music, like stylistically. And, uh, but you know, he's a, he's a talented guy. I guess he's like old school Bruno Mars because Bruno Mars has kind of gone in a different direction as of late with his, uh, smoking out the window. I think, I think that's how it goes. <laughs> uh, but I like newer Bruno Mars better than older Bruno Mars. I don't know. Sorry. I'm talking about Bruno Mars. You're talking about Torrin Wells, but, but that's cool. I can't remember if I, uh, the name, so that's the thing. I listen to so much music that a lot of these songs I probably knew, but I just kind of like, ah, it's nothing special. And so I, I don't remember them. So that's why I always got to keep notes. But if it doesn't, if the song doesn't really wow me in any way, if it, if I'm not disgusted by it, if I don't hate it, or if I don't love it, I just forget about it, you know? So, so I can't, the name, the, the, the name fake it by torn Wells seems familiar, but I can't recall how it goes. Uh, anyway, moving on getaway by Taya and, uh, Taya, she's the one who's from, uh, Hillsong. Uh, this was the only Christian song released last year that made me feel emotional. I think Taya's voice complements the piano really well and creates a really soothing song. The only Taya song that I can remember because it was like consistently on the charts, uh, was the, uh, I think it's called for all my life for all my life. And it's not a bad song. It just didn't really. Again, it didn't really, it wasn't really special enough to make it on either list, but Taya seems cool. I, I have problems with Hillsong, but I don't, I don't know Taya personally enough. I know I used to have a crush on her, um, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's cool. I can't seem to remember the song Getaway, but Taya seems like a pretty, she seems like a nice person. And for all my life is not a bad song. So Mama's by Ann Wilson. Ann Wilson was on uh, my best of list. So this is, you know, this is good. This is such a wholesome tune and I can't help but smile every time I listen to this song. Again, I can't really remember this song, but from what I remember, I mean, the title gives it away, of course, but, you know, it's about moms. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, but I don't remember hating the song. So uh, most songs by Ann Wilson, I did, you know, I liked. There was that one song that was kind of like a girl power song. I'm like, ah, oh, this it's not really for me, you know. <laughs> uh, oh, I can't remember what what song that was, but cool. Mama's by Ann Wilson. Blown away by Hillsong United. The stripped back instrumental really focuses you to, really forces you to focus on the lyrics, which is what I really like about this song. Blown away, I don't believe... From what I remember, there was only like one Hillsong song, uh, surprisingly, that I remember making in the top charts. And I wonder if it's because of the documentary that came out last year that maybe has something to do with it. Again, I've said I have problems with Hillsong, so I can't really comment on this song. I, I don't remember listening to it, but that's cool. Hillsong United has, has made good music before. I just have a problem with them as a church. And I've had some... The things that I've accused... That I accused in my top 10 worst list. That I accused like Elevation and uh, Maverick City of. Hillsong has definitely been guilty of. So... I'm sorry to, to rain on your parade on all these songs that you like. That's cool though. That's just... I'm just giving my offhand thoughts. And Thomas continues, as far as albums go, my personal favorite from last year was Benjamin William Hastings' self-titled album. I'm surprised I haven't really heard of that. It's clear that this album comes from a place of self-reflection and a genuine desire to be a good artist, dad, and worship leader. Uh, I'm not as familiar I'm not really that familiar with Benjamin William Hastings, and I feel 
I feel like I'm a bad Christian music reviewer. I try my best to keep stop notifications. I don't know if you guys heard that. Actually, no. I try to keep my finger on the pulse of most things Christian music, but it's it's not as easy. But um, that's cool. I'll have to check out uh, Benjamin William Hastings. We got another. Co- uh, thank you, Thomas, for for uh, sh- for sharing that. Uh, we got another comment from Art Mark Edward Murphy. It says Whiteheart did Bye Bye Babylon better. That's probably a bit before your time. So, so what he's referring to is that Bye Bye Babylon by Elevation Worship. Surprisingly, you'll have to watch the episode to, to hear my explanation. It, it made it in my top 10 best list. And apparently Whiteheart has a song called Bye Bye Babylon. I will say, as you say, uh, that's probably a bit before your time. That's usually not really uh, a problem for me. Some people who have been watching my show for a while know that I I listen to a lot of old school stuff, even stuff that's even before my time. I mean, Keith Green is one of my all time favorite artists, and yeah, other artists from like that era. But I'll have to say, I never really got into. I was not raised with White Heart. I guess a big reason why I listen to a lot of the old Christian music today that I do today is because my parents introduced it to me. My dad was not really a, a rock or metal head. I mean, he listened to some rock. It was more like Daniel Amos, Larry Norman kind of rock. But uh wasn't a White Heart guy. So I actually didn't know about White Heart until like in the past couple of years, honestly. So... I'll have to check out Bye Bye Babylon by White Hart. I'm sure it's a great classic rock song. But um Yeah, thanks for thanks for your comments. Everyone, thanks for the feedback. I'm glad that you guys uh well, I hope that you guys got something out of my list. I know it was really it was really weird list. Um a lot of Weird contradictions, I'm sure, that people would accuse me of. But, you know, I had fun doing it. And it was a lot more easier format to do than when I when I edited the, the 2020 lists. Because that just, like, took up so much time. But, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I guess maybe, maybe there's some audio feed news that I could talk about. Uh, I can't remember what I, what we talked about last time in terms of, because they're just continuing to, they're just continuing to announce bangers, man. Uh, I think the last, I think Ronnie Martin and Sarah Billups was the, were the last people that I, um, mentioned that they announced other people that they announced are uh and this is for audio feed festival for those of you who don't know i had a whole video on audio feed festival uh they announced two minute minor uh chris bernstorff and the illogical spoon i'll have to say i'm not familiar with any of those people two minute minor is chicago-based hardcore punk performing their last midwest show hmm and Chris Bernstorff is a top shelf poet is top shelf poetry from Michigan. So I guess um, he is spoken word. So that's that's cool. The Illogical Spoon is an immersive sonic experience presented by a band of anarchists, theologians, and ecologists. Ooh, interesting. Uh, moving on, uh, some some artists that I am more familiar with the ongoing concept. I'm really excited about that there. I think they started out as a Christian band and I'm not sure. I don't think that that's where they're at right now, unfortunately, but I'm still a fan of their music. They, they're some really unique, hardcore music that usually has, they usually have like a, a really cool Southern kind of twist on it. And they're just very unique. And they're coming out with a new album this year. And they've come out with a couple singles. And I, I really like it. 
That's not my Christian music recommendation because I can't say whether they're a Christian or not. But uh, but I do recommend it if you guys like some hardcore music. Uh, speaking of which, we also got Lightworker, who's a heavy and hopeful Bay Area metal, and Bloodline, South Texas heavy metal core. Not as familiar with those guys, but should be good. Then we got Wind Words. Psalms and Songs from Florida. I guess they're, they're, they're more of a worshipful kind of band. Uh, Rosemont, they're uh, emo soul from Michigan. And Pocket Vinyl, which is piano rock with live painting from, Connect, from uh, yeah. So that sounds interesting. And then lastly, their their most recent announcement is My Epic, which is uh they're more like a post I don't even know the terms anymore, like post rock, post hardcore, I don't know, because they're they're not like screamo or anything. Last time I listened to them, but uh a lot of their lyrics are very from, at least from what I remember, very spiritual kind of stuff and uh, great vocals as well. So I'm, I'm excited to check, to uh, check out their show. So yeah, just thought I'd keep you guys updated on a little bit of audio feed news. It's really exciting for me because um, I'm going to be involved in it in some way, some form. Can't really give all the details right now, mostly because it's not really set in stone quite yet but i will at least be there so all right so to the main topic for now and and here's the thing is that like i i i struggled for a long time you know when i came back with the show you know after we had that season break i was like what am i going to talk about there's been, <laughs> so you guys remember when I took that November break from social media and I was kind of expecting there to be like a lot of news to talk about when I got back and there really wasn't that much, didn't, wasn't really any mind blowing stuff aside from like the whole thing with Matt Chandler and that wasn't even music news. I was kind of hoping for some more music news, Christian music news. Well, it, it just had to happen. All the crazy stuff had to happen while I was gone for the season break for the for the holiday break yeah and it's like am I gonna by the time I get back it's gonna be old news especially since I'm not I'm gonna be starting off with the top 10 lists and I won't be able to talk about uh interesting stuff uh like topical stuff welcome solid sloth solid sloth says beard is looking good thanks man been uh, been trying to get it trimmed recently. He's always so critical of my of my beard, and it hurts my feelings. But uh, a lot of a lot of stuff happened. There was the firstly there was the stuff with uh, with Amy Grant and her hosting a, a gay wedding, and then there was the there was the stuff with the Grammys. Uh, not that I really wanted to talk about like the, the, the Sam Smith stuff, but like the Maverick city music, like Maverick city music being involved in such there was that. And there was, um, oh yeah. And the Kanye West stuff, you know, so this is a whole lot of stuff that I, I probably could talk about, but by now it's kind of old news and like everyone has been talking about it. And so I'm like, do I really want to? I, th I thought about like tackling everything all at once and doing a, sh a sort of like, sh you know, sh shotgun round through through all of them. You don't know who these people are. You don't know Amy Grant. You don't know. Well, that's fine. That's what that's why I'm here. Solid sauce. Like, I don't know who these people are. Well, that's totally fine. That's why I'm here to bring the news can we talk about how fire the new Paramore album is? No, because I haven't listened to it. I'm not really, I'm not really up, up on the Paramore bandwagon. So I'm not saying that I don't like them, but anyways, so I thought about like, what if I talked about those, but I'm like, I don't really want to because 
everyone's talking. We're going to talk about the Asbury revival. No, we're not. Because everyone and their mother has an opinion about that. And I want to talk about something that's a bit more niche. So this is the topic that is not going to get me views on YouTube. Because no one is talking about this. But oh well. This, um, this is what I'm... I, and I like talking about more niche stuff anyways. Especially when it has to do with like the independent Christian music scene. Uh, and bringing a bit more attention to it. Sometimes I just get tired of like the mainstream stuff. So Levi the Poet is what we're talking about. And so for those of you who don't know, I talked about Levi the Poet in my audio feed video. I talked about how much I was a fan of him. Levi the Poet is basically like the only spoken word artist that that I've been a fan of. Other, not including like me without you and listener, because they are, it's more like music, you know, and it's just, um, you know, kind of a style. And me without you and listener kind of lately have been, they, well, me without you is no longer recording music, but the, in the, in their, you know, last, last few albums and listener, there was kind of a bit more focus on singing anyways, but Levi the Poet. Spoken word, poetry, Christian, and I was always a big fan of him. And he uh, he has a really good way with words. I've always loved. It. I've actually met him twice. I met him. I met him at a show with Listener actually, and I met him at Audio Feed. And I've actually got some signed albums from him as well that my friends got for me. Um. And he he decided to come out with a, a documentary. Oh, which by the way, Levi has he's created like probably one of my favorite albums of all time, Correspondence. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that album because it has to do with the documentary. But he decided to do a documentary. Well, I don't know if he really decided to do a documentary. I think it was more um a friend of his decided to he wanted to make a documentary about Levi. He's like, "Hey, can I film you and can I make a documentary about you and Levi's like, "All right, <laughs> sure, because I don't know if I would be like, "Hey, you know what? I want someone to make a documentary about me. I think it's about time. Maybe it is about time, but anyways, so the documentary is called "It's All Worth Living for." the first 10 years and it's basically about the first 10 years of his career which is crazy to think that it's been 10 years already and it's really interesting i i mostly overall really liked the documentary and it's a, it goes into a lot of stuff it goes into his beginnings like how he got in on the scene cuz it's such a it's such a, a niche thing, spoken word artistry. And it's really cool because he talks about how he was inspired by Bradley Hathaway, who is basically the, I guess, the pioneer for Christian spoken word. Um, so um, I, I always wondered if he was inspired by Bradley Hathaway, and I'm glad that he that he actually gave some... some uh, Paid some homage to Bradley Hathaway. He's got some good stuff too. And he also goes a lot into his his past and um something that he's all he's been very open about is his relationship with his dad and his upbringing. His dad was a missionary and he he passed away early and before that, there was a lot of, he was dealing with a lot of mental illness that made it really hard for, for him and his family. And so Levi's always been pretty open about that in his, in his works. And he even talks about in the, in the documentary, he's like, man, I wonder if I was a bit too open, like was, cause he's like, you know, I, I'm a creative and I, um, I like talking 
about things that I'm dealing with. Uh, by the way, yeah, solid slot. That sounds good. I'm totally down for for getting together sometime. And uh, thanks, thanks for dropping in. But um, so he talks in the documentary, and he even like has conversations with his mom and his sister. And he's like, "Was I a bit? Was I too open?" about this to the point where it was uncomfortable for you guys and caused problems for you guys. So that's a really interesting part about the documentary. It's interesting how he he talks about how he got in uh in on the scene because it kind of he kind of like got involved in the the heavy music scene. See you later solid sloth. He's got to he's got to dip out. <laughs> um and so that's really interesting because like, I always kind of wondered like, how do you, how do you start off on like such a niche? Cause I, I, I can relate to that. How I, I started out as the, with, with my music, I started out as like the acoustic indie guy in a very like heavy metal kind of scene. And so it was always awkward for me. Like I, I got, sh I, I played shows where I was the only acoustic indie guy and that was kind of short Forest's history for a while. Whereas like the only shows that were happening were heavy metal and punk shows. Eventually the scene changed a bit uh, more to where we could fit in. But like, I totally understand like being the odd one out, you know? So it was really interesting to hear him talk about how he, um, how he was able to break into that, how he was basically the guy at a show who did spoken word in between sets. And it's like, yes, I was that. I was a guy playing acoustic guitar and singing while the bands were switching out their, uh, for the next set. It's like, I totally get that. And it was so weird for me. So, so that's really cool. And it's really cool to hear about how he grew into his, his craft and how they, how they changed the the format of spoken word, how like with his recordings, it wasn't just like him talking into a microphone, like how they got creative with like the music that, you know, put some music in there as well. And how he teamed up with his friends about that. And uh, so it's really cool to hear about his, his beginnings and, and what that was like for him and for, and how that affected his faith as well. And he, he talks about how he started to make his, uh, create his, his album, the one that I love correspondence because correspondence was a very different album for him. And we're going to get into that. And cause I also got some other things to talk about in the documentary that actually kind of concerns me a lot so this isn't just an episode where I have high praise for the whole thing I have some concerns as well not really about the documentary about but about Levi the poet as well so I hope that'll interest you to keep watching keep listening we're going to get into an ad break really quick so don't go away we'll be right back and uh yeah, we'll, 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 we'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back.
alright, alright. Let's bring it on back. Let's bring it on back to the show. <laughs> alright, so getting back to Levi the Poet. Well, I guess one thing you should know for for those of you who haven't listened to Levi the Poet is that his first few albums were, you know, they were basically track after track uh, about, you know, different different things. Mostly very personal. A lot of very personal stuff is basically Levi just opening his heart to to everyone. By the way, Levi's full name is Levi McAllister. Uh, not sure if I... I should probably clarify that. He's not just Levi the Poet. But yeah, that was like all of his albums from Werewolves to Monologues to Seasons. Seasons was a really great album. But in my opinion, I think his his best work is his album Correspondence. Now, Correspondence is a very different album because he decided he wanted to tell a story with this album. That wasn't his. He wanted to write a piece of work that told a story about someone else that tells, doesn't exist, a fictional story. And I, I really like how he talks about, and, and also it just like, it feels different than his other albums. It's, it's a lot more calmer. Uh, a lot of his, his previous albums, there is a lot of screaming. So I, I, I can understand how he was very popular in the, and like the metal hardcore scene because there was that kind of element but this was different there was it was more just like telling a story he still is very like emotive in his in, in the way that he delivers the, the stories but but it was very different and and the music also is you know is different as well the, the the sort of like background music that goes along. Well, I, I don't want to say background music. It, it is a craft. It does come together as like one piece of art. It's not like that he's just talking over background music. It, it weaves in together very well. And I love this album. Definitely, it's most likely in like top 20 albums for me. There's no other album that I know that's that's like it. And it's just beautifully written and he goes into on the docu documentary what it was like because he actually had some insecurities about it and and I never really thought about it before and we're going to watch a just I'm just going to play a clip it's a bit it's it's a bit long so maybe I'll like cut in every so every so often but he talks about how that was kind of he was very nervous about it because it was so different and but you know I'll just I'll just let him talk. Yeah, so so moving from seasons into correspondence was very odd, scary and freeing life-giving to me at the same time. Up until that point, I had never released something that wasn't autobiographical or more of like journal entry kind of thing. And so I was afraid that maybe the audience Whoever was attracted to what I was doing thus far, I was nervous that maybe sorry one that they wouldn't I'm just putting um, my face here. like what I was wanting to do with correspondence. But then two, I I've always thought and been far too concerned about what other people are thinking of me. Uh, that's a a thing that I know and that I'm I'm trying to do less of. But there was a fear, especially with the amount of more kind of like missional and evangelical work um, and, and kind of like gospel presenting stuff that I had done up until the point in time that correspondence was a thing, that it made me nervous that since this was so very different, perhaps the perception was going to be, oh no, Levi is moving away from something and we can no longer support him. And I've watched that happen to a lot of bands and a lot of artists, so it's not entirely unfounded, but it was it was definitely something that apparently in the end didn't scare me enough to shy me away from doing the project as I ended up doing it. But I had a lot of conversations with people during the entire lead up to the Kickstarter and then the release date. I remember 
when I very first started to consider the idea that correspondence was. Um, I remember being on the road at that time and we were listening through this series of lectures given by uh, a pastor in New York named Timothy Keller and their church hosted this thing called the I, I will Arch say that if this is the Timothy Keller that I'm thinking of, I'm not a huge fan of Tim Keller and his some of his stances on uh, like critical race theory and all that. But, you know, not to say that he's not a brother. He may be. I don't really know a whole lot about him. But I, I will say I do like what he says here. Fellowship. And he was he was just a sense, he was talking about art and he was talking about the way that different people approached art and he was specifically loving the way that Tolkien approached his art mythologically with the Lord of the Rings talking about the inherent goodness of a story as a thing that can exist and point in the direction of truth without having to be explicit about it because it can just be a good thing in and of itself. At the same time, I was listening to a series of lectures from RTS down in Florida about C.S. Lewis and the way that beauty was what he could not reconcile with his unbelief. And that was fascinating to me because all growing up, I, I, I loved me. I mean, certainly a lot of my childhood played into this because I... I loved music, I loved what it did to me, I loved the way that it seemed to point me in the direction of the creator of that beauty, which is exactly what C.S. Lewis was describing at the time, and exactly what Tolkien was articulating in the inherent goodness of a story, without having to basically like Bible bash people over the head with what the actual message ended up being. And they actually didn't like one another's art. Well. Tolkien never cared as much for Lewis's art because he thought that it was too on the nose, that the analogies were too obvious, and he wanted the narrative to be buried even deeper. All of that to say, it resonated with my spirit because growing up, my dad would always ask me, like, why? He, he, always, he asked why a lot. And, and if it was music I was listening to, he wanted to know why, and he wanted to know what I got out of the lyrics, and he wanted to know if what I was getting out of the lyrics was appropriate, if it was good or bad, if I was guarding my heart, et cetera, et cetera. But I never, I never remember viewing things quite in quite as binary a way where I was a lot more comfortable with a lot more things. And this felt almost like the permission that I needed to be able to say, I can create something that's beautiful. That in and of itself can be an act of worship. I don't need to explicitly articulate every single facet of the gospel story that I thought that I needed to in order to just make something that might be just as truthful as, as it would have been if it was some literal interpretation given to an audience's ears. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so one so second. moving from seasons into correspondence. Sorry, I just needed to do something really quick. Um, so, yeah, I. I, there's a whole lot of that that I, I just completely resonate with. And I think I think there's a lot of that that's really lost in not just Christian music, but just Christian entertainment in general. I want to preface this that I, I do, I completely agree that there is an importance and a value in presenting the gospel in our art. There's a lot of artists that do that, that I really appreciate. It kind of depends on how they do it because there are artists out there who have made it their goal to, to emphasize the gospel in their message. And they do a wonderful job at it because they care about their craft and they know that that's, that's important, that if we want to share the gospel to non-believers, that, you know, we can't do it half-heartedly, you know? there There's people like Josh Garrels who, you know, every song is like a, a, a gospel message or, or, or worship to God. And artists like, like Keith Green, you know? But... 
I also think that there's an importance. I mean, I think we've there's something that we've lost and something that we used to value, like back in the historical times, you know, that conservatives seemed to value so much. Art was so different back then where, yeah, you had your artist who gave glory to God by presenting something about like from the gospel or the Bible, but you also had artists who, who loved God and, but all they really wanted to do was make a beautiful piece of work, whether it be a, whether it be music or, or a painting or a sculpture and, and that was their worship, and that's how they gave glory to God. Not because, I mean, and they they didn't need, they didn't feel the need, just like Levi, to have every single facet of the gospel presented in their piece. And I'm not saying that, like, either or, that we need to have one and not the other. I think both are great. And I think that that's something that we're, we've kind of lost where we don't appreciate, we, a lot of Christians don't appreciate good art anymore because they're looking for, they're waiting for someone to say the name of Jesus or something. It's like, say Jesus in your music or say Jesus from the stage, you know, whatever. But it's like, I think there's a, there's a purpose for, for both of those things. I think both can can bring people to Christ, you know. Um, I mean, yeah, I think that that Christian artists that maybe decide not to put Jesus in every single song or preach Jesus from the stage, I think they should be open about their faith at least, and you know, like live by example, so that people who maybe just hear their songs on the radio and they, and they may not be believers and they listen to their music and they're like, Oh, this is like, actually, this is well-crafted music. And I really like this. I want to find out more about the artist. And they find out that they're a Christian and that, and they find out that they're, you know, may hopefully doing their best to live a good life, uh, a life of example. And that can bring people to Christ as well. I think both are, are very important, and, and I love that approach that Levi took with this album. And yeah, it's it's not preachy or anything. It's just him writing a good story and him crafting a good album, you know? I And, I, and I'm, I've talked about this before. I had a whole video on, like, whether artists, uh, you know, like singers or whatever who are Christians... Um, whether they need to be Christian artists. And I go into more into what I mean in the video, but like I gave a few examples. Like I know I talk about Keith Green a lot, but like if you read Keith Green's biography that his wife wrote, they talk about how they they were planning on making an album that wasn't um, that wasn't like a Christian album. It was going to be more accessible to non-believers for the purpose of pointing them to Christ, where like all the songs were going to be more about like raising questions rather than answering them. And I think that they never did because Keith Green tragically died in the plane crash. But I think that that's totally, totally cool for someone to do that and and he brought brought up the example of like Tolkien and Lewis and yes Lewis was a bit more on the nose about his faith but the Chronicles of Narnia are like they're famous not just with Christians but with many other people and there are even some people who have surprisingly been like oh wow I never realized that this like these were you know, that, that this was supposed to be like Christian or whatever, that these had uh, a lot of the symbolism was Christian or whatever, not, not an allegory. Lewis never really liked the term allegory for his books, but, but yeah. And then like Lord of the Rings, even more accessible to a lot of people. And yeah, they're not as like uh, upfront with like, you know, 
you really have to go digging to find some of the Christian symbolism. Like there is actually a God figure in Lord of the Rings. It, it, they just don't really talk about it. And well, in like the world of middle earth, they don't really talk about it in Lord of the Rings, but there is a God figure, but you really have to go digging and looking uh, to find that in Tolkien's work. And there's so, there's so many fans of Lord of the Rings that aren't Christians almost like it's almost kind of a bad thing because now like I feel like studios have been like they, they've been taking a hold of it and not doing its due diligence but anyways enough about Lord of the Rings but I think those are perfect examples of pieces of art they are fiction but they're pieces of art that may not be so upfront about the gospel but have still brought people, they've still been able to point people to Christ in, in some way. Maybe not always successfully, but, you know, that's kind of up to the Holy Spirit. Um, but, yeah, so that's something that I feel like that we've lost in art today. And uh, I just wanted to talk about that aspect of the documentary that I really appreciated. I still love the album correspondence, and I highly recommend people check it out. Um, but... Unfortunately, there were some concerns, as I mentioned before, about, about Levi that I've actually had for a while because I followed Levi on, on social media and I've seen some of his posts and his follow-up to correspondence, his album Cataracts, I, lis I haven't listened to that album in a while. I did like it at the time, but there were some things about Cataracts that kind of stood out to me. And it's like, huh, I think Levi's going through some changes, like maybe theologically and politically and such. And I was right. I wish if I wish I had time to like really examine Cataracts before this episode, but I didn't have much time. But basically the documentary... Uh, confirmed some things for me. That's just kind of concerning. And I've, I've had these concerns from Levi for a long time, just based off of the things that he's, that he's posted on social media and like watching that, it was like, uh, I kind of feel like, kind of feel like Levi's going a bit progressive with some of his thoughts. And I'll just share this clip, there is a portion, there are certain segments in the documentary where Levi, and it was kind of split up, you know, spread throughout the documentary of Levi reading this, uh, something that he wrote that was supposed to be like a letter to himself 10 years ago. And so like, he's giving him advice and such, and some of it's pretty lighthearted and some of it's pretty good. But there are some portions, there is a couple portions in it specifically that was very telling for me. And so we're just going to watch a little clip. Just a reminder, this is a, a letter that he wrote to himself that he's now reading on, on film. You will meet people who have been through unspeakable evils that somehow find you to be a safe place for lightening their burdens. It will be heavy, but it will be worth it. They speak in different tongues. They inhabit different countries. They descend from different races. They identify by traditional and non-traditional orientations. They believe different things, and they are all of them made in the image and the likeness of God. People whom he loves and cares about. Do not squander your opportunity to listen. Do not presume to be the teacher. Do not forfeit your opportunity to learn. So, yeah, for and in case like you guys missed it, it's I mean, it's pretty obvious. Levi basically says, don't I'm sorry, I'm kind of like my my stomach's growling a little bit. I haven't eaten anything, so I apologize if you're hearing that through the microphone. He basically says, hey, like it starts off good. It's like, hey, be sure to like 
listen to people from different backgrounds and such, you know, um, and to pay attention to what they're saying. And, the, you know, they have, they'll be of different races of different cultural backgrounds and such. It's like, okay, that's fine. Uh, and then he goes into, they'll be of different sexual orientations and, and genders, whatever, um, and different beliefs and such. And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. And, and that's a bit, that's a bit progressive. Um, and, um, pretty borderline universalist. And, and I've seen, I've seen Levi quote on social media, uh, segments of, uh, Richard Rohr's writing and Richard Rohr is basically the father of modern universalism. I have a lot of qualms with Richard Rohr. I think that he is a just to be blunt, I, I think that he is a false teacher. If any of these guys that ever all the heresy hunters name is a false teacher, he is he is definitely uh, one for me. And so, but before I, I get really into it, I also wanted to share this portion of of the documentary where he talks about the like what was the story behind like cataracts, his album cataracts and what happened. And it, and it's something that I actually didn't know. And it's very telling. And he talks about, uh, Mars Hill. So, uh, let's, uh, let's take a gander at that. There were four years between correspondence and cataracts, which is not exactly ideal. As far as album releases for full-time artists go, my world and thousands of people's worlds blew up in the time between. Cataracts is as close to a religious deconstruction album as any. But I'm tired of that word. I was tired of it then. I was a part of the infamous collapse of Mars Hill, which, and I don't think that this is wrong, sort of segued into the collapse of a lot more than that within evangelicalism as a whole. So, Cataracts is a critique, in a lot of ways, born out of years worth of sifting through disappointment and disillusionment, but it took a really long time for me to find anything reconstructive to say, and I needed that. I wasn't willing to add to the vitriolic noise without that. I had a bunch of pissed off songs, but I wanted them to be umbrellaed by something worth hoping for. Something that at least risked the possibility of redemption. Which took a long time for me to find myself, let alone give to anyone else. So, that to me is very telling. For those of you who need some background, Mars Hill Church was a mega church led by Mark, Mark Driscoll. And there is an infamous falling out you know with the whole church a lot of controversies involving mark driscoll and his leadership and the whole church eventually just you know dissipated and i i, I would recommend the uh the podcast the rise and fall of mars hill but i'll after as a as like a companion to that i would recommend coltish's podcast on mars hill because i think they kind of offer some things that the rise and fall of mars hill does not the rise and fall of mars hill kind of um it's it's really good in its journalism and critiquing a lot of the things but they draw they they jump to some conclusions where it's like oh it's because they had complementarian uh, theology that that's why it was it was bad and why it wasn't good or this or that and or there was uh, too there was so much of a focus on like biblical masculinity or whatever it's like mm, no you can't really say that, that was the reason I think you can say that Mark Driscoll was just a poor a very poor leader but anyways so I, I would I would recommend that but Mars Hill, it hurt a lot of people. I know. A, a lot of people were affected by it. And surprisingly, a lot of people who are like in the independent Christian music scene, there was a lot of people that were involved in that church and they and they got hurt. And 
it's it's frustrating and maddening for me because it caused a lot of people to either uh, fall from the faith or like de- you know like deconstruct and fall away from the faith or deconstruct and like become something a lot more progressive than what they started out to be. And I'm not saying that like Mars Hill had great theology, but I can understand the hurt that a lot of people felt i can understand the hurt that levi feels for this but so and and i'll get into that but this is very telling as to why levi is at the position is at the point that he's at now because you know when people get hurt at churches this tends to happen a lot yeah you know i know from experience and so i think that is very telling as to why we're why he's at where he is, but I wanted to I wanted to address the things that he said in his um, in his letter to himself about being being able to listen to those of different backgrounds, different sexual orientations, and you know different sexual preferences and different beliefs and such. I got no problem with you know listening to people of different cultural backgrounds and different ethnicities and all that. But, but here's the thing is that should we approach conversations with people that we disagree with, with humility and love? Like, yes, absolutely. And that's one thing that I admire about Levi is that he does have a lot of humility and love almost to a fault i would say but it's true it's and it's biblical is that we should be quick to listen and slow to speak and you know when we're interacting with people of different beliefs we don't want to come off as pompous know-it-alls we don't want to be off-putting or we don't we don't want to be turn-offs for anyone who could potentially hear the gospel of Christ. We don't want to appear prideful and, and, and know it all and such. We should be humble to a degree and loving also. Otherwise we're going to seem like we're bashing people in the face with Bibles, you know, but that doesn't mean that we that we escape from the authority of God's word and his standards. Now Levi, I'm sure I'm sure you're at a point where you don't really believe this anymore, but God's word is is pretty clear about about how we, you know, God's word is pretty clear about his his thoughts on homosexuality and you know and beyond with all those things it's pretty clear and you uh, i'm sorry but you'd be incorrect to think that it says anything differently you're changing the word uh, uh, of god it is pretty clear the bible is also clear about its inerrancy there i mean people there are many Christians who would be like, yeah, the Bible does say that, but, you know, but, but they don't believe that, th- that God's word has authority and that God's word is inerrant. So it's a very progressive way of thinking, which is, is wrong. You have to have some sort of standard. If you have a, f- if you believe in God, you have to believe in his standard in, in his, in his word. Otherwise, it's no faith at all. You're just kind of making things up as you go, which a lot of progressives are doing that anyways. But, but yeah, just because we're being, we're being humble and loving to people of different beliefs who don't think the same way that we do, who don't feel the same way that we do, that doesn't, that we do need to be humble and loving towards them, but that doesn't mean we escape from the authority of God's word and his standards. When we surrender to Christ, we surrender to his will and his ways, and we let go of our agenda and our ways. Making sure that 
we stay within God's standards and teaching others to do the same has nothing to do with pride. Quite the opposite, actually. I, I'm sure for Levi, I'm sure it's it's hard. It is hard to have those conversations with people that you disagree with. People people can come across as like so heartfelt and like very genuine about how they feel. They're like, well, I I feel this way. I disagree with the Bible on this. It's like, this is who I am. And it's very, it can be very compelling sometimes. And so it's hard to come across as the guy who says, no, that's wrong. It's hard, especially when you come to know the people personally and they become your friends. It's like, it's really hard to tell them that they're wrong and that that's the way that they're living is, is sinful. It is. And I, I totally get it. And so I can understand how he feels like it's, it's a prideful thing to, he mentions, uh, don't assume to be uh, for yourself to be the, the teacher. I know I butchered that, but that's, he's like, don't, don't assume that you're the teacher in every situation. And he makes it come across as if it's a it's a prideful thing to to be the guy saying no what you're doing is wrong but it it's quite the opposite actually because before Christ we want to chase after our flesh we want to chase after what we want and how we feel and how we think but when we surrender to Christ we have to get rid of all that and that is not prideful. That's not easy to do. If I had my way, I would, I would, I just wouldn't care. I just, I would just let everyone do what they want. But it's not about what I want. It's not about my will. It's about God's will and what he clearly says in his Bible. And if you have a problem interpreting the Bible that way and being under that authority, I guess that, I guess that's your problem. And there's nothing that I can, there's not a whole lot that I can do to change your mind. But, but yeah, it's just, it, it is sad to see. And I'm not trying, this whole episode is not, I mean, I said some good things about the documentary that I liked. And I would, I would still definitely recommend people check out Levi the Poet and his, especially his older stuff. And I don't want this episode to be like bashing on Levi at all. It's basically more like I hope this to be like a sort of letter, an open letter to him to, you know, just offer some advice, I guess. Because, yeah, Levi, I have a there's there's a whole lot that I admire about you. And I like I said, I, I love the way that you love and that how humble you are and Maybe you did grow up in a Christianity that was prideful, that did come off as like pompous and, and know-it-all. But just because you had that upbringing, that doesn't mean that you have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Continue to love and be humble. Yes, absolutely. But... Don't let go of your love for God's law and his word. I know law is a, it's a bad word for, for us to say, and I'm not talking about the Old Testament law, but like I'm talking about his standards and what and the way that he has asked us to live as Christians. Yes, like there's grace, absolutely, and we're not going to get things perfect at all. And there is room. There's room for mistakes, and there's grace. Just as long as we're doing our best and don't sorry i'm still <laughs> i'm still hungry don't let your feelings take control and don't let the world influence your faith i know it's really hard because like you and i are kind of similar we want to get along with everyone we want to have conversations with everyone because we want to connect with everyone and we don't want to disappoint anyone the more we do that, though, it becomes harder and harder to stand for the truth and to stand for what God's word says. And it just all of a sudden becomes easier to neglect that, to neglect God's word, because 
we don't want to upset anyone. And that is that in itself is kind of a form of, of pride, you know? And I'm saying this because I struggle with it too. We start to care more about what people think about us than what God's word actually says. And that's not really compassionate because according to God's word, people who live in sin, you know what's going to happen to them. We know where they're going to spend eternity. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I don't want the same thing to happen to you. I don't want you to totally lose ground in your faith. I want you to stay strong in, in what God says. And, you know, so don't let the world influence your faith. And coming back to the Mars Hill thing, don't let the sins of other Christians influence your faith. God and his word are absolute and perfect. Humans are not. Mark Driscoll is not, obviously. But here's the other thing. Richard Rohr is not. Levi McAllister is not. I'm not. But God is. And I'm telling you, this is from this is coming from experience. I was raised in in, in ministry. My dad was a pastor. He he's a he's a chaplain now, so he's still in ministry. But man, a lot of the hurt that I and my family experienced, a majority of it is through the church. Is through other Christians. It's sad to say, but it's true. And you know, there's the saying, hurt people hurt people, and that does that does not exclude Christians. Or people who at least label themselves Christian. And I've been I've experienced hurt in like the two years that I was in full-time ministry. You know, obviously I'm not in it now, but I haven't lost my faith. I did lose my desire to be in full-time ministry, though. <laughs> but it wasn't really even because of hurt. It was kind of a whole different thing. But I did experience hurt. And you just can't let that influence you, man. You can't let that affect you because God, God's word is absolute and perfect and he does not change. The God that you believed 10 years ago is the same as he is today. And what his word says is true is still true today. So don't let your experiences, your experience in ministry and don't let your experience in the church affect your theology so don't let anyone don't let even me influence your theology let, let god's word be your standard you know there's a lot of people there's a lot of christians that i disagree with theologically but i know that we're still brothers you know and sisters sorry to exclude any women out there <laughs> but um yeah, so I know I kind of got on a soapbox right there, and I apologize. I don't mean to be, <sighs> I don't mean to be preachy, but you know, th those were just some concerns that I've had, and I've had for a long time. Like I said, because of things that I've seen Levi post, and I just got really, I've been really concerned. And Levi's never really been so outright, but I. With this documentary, it, it makes a lot more sense, and I have a better idea of where he's at now. So be in prayer for Levi. I mean, he's a great guy. He's a, He has a great heart as well. You can tell by his his work with to write, love on, to write Love on Her Arms. He has a great heart for people in depression, if it's dealing with mental illness, people dealing with uh, suicidal thoughts. He has a great big heart for it, and it's awesome. 
um, but I don't want his his love for people to trump his love for God's word. So, and I I would actually recommend you guys check out his, the documentary, um, not to write love on her arms. It's all worth living for the first ten years. It's um, you can find it on his website. You could probably find links to it in his social media. I would recommend it. It's a it's a good documentary, and I overall liked it. I just, you know, had some issues with some of the things that he said. And and check out his stuff. Ch uh, check out, especially correspondence. I would recommend anything before. Anything correspondence in before. You know, Seasons is really good. Werewolves and monologues are a lot more, like, DIY feeling and not as great, like, quality-wise. But it's still good stuff. Very, very emotional stuff. But uh, yeah, so those were my thoughts on Levi the Poet's documentary. And I know that not many people probably care, but hopefully I'll draw some, maybe draw some Levi the Poet fans over here. But uh, yeah, and I hope people understand that this is all coming from a place of, of love and concern, you know. So and there's a lot of people that may disagree with me and, you know, that's totally fine. I'm, I'm open to having, you know constructive conversations you know so all right well we're getting near the end of our show but gonna bring back a certain segment called in my honest in my humble opinion my humble opinion i i've forgotten the name of my segment <laughs> it's been so long is it my honest opinion or my humble opinion I can uh, I can look up that right now in my old videos. Wow. Um, my humble opinion. <laughs> okay, so my humble opinion. I want to share some. It's basically a chance for me to share some music that I liked and share my thoughts on it. And um, I decided that, you know, with the my last couple episodes I did, it, it worked pretty well with the sharing the, like, 10-second clips of the music I'm talking about. And I know some people have asked me about that, and I'm going to risk it. I don't think I should be getting, like, copyright blocked or anything, fingers crossed, but we're going we're gonna to try this out for now, so... Uh, and these are going to be relatively short reviews because they don't really have much to say, but I'm just kind of just recommending this music. Uh, but uh, Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors talked about them before. He has a, a new a new song out called Fly. And if you don't know Drew Holcomb, he's a lot more in the area of like folk music. And I know I put Ellie Holcomb in my top 10 worst songs, but, you know, I you know, still love you, Ellie. <laughs> I love you, Drew. Uh, I like your music. And, uh, yeah, Fly is just really good. It's probably my favorite song that I've heard from him in a while. I think it's – I like it better than than the, the project that he did with Johnny Swim. So I don't know if he's working on a new album or not, but uh, this is, is a pretty good song. Not really, uh, it's about, um, I don't know really what it's about, but it's good. <laughs> uh, I know it's about flying away and he, in the verses he's talking about how he's this, he's like describing different people and I'd be very interested to know what the, what the meaning is behind it. But either way, it's a good sounding song. So, uh, yeah, fly by Drew Holcomb and the neighbors. And I'm on a fly I'm gonna fly All right, and next up and I'm sorry this this is basically going to be a lot of a lot of indie folk music. So that's just kind of the mu that's the music that I that I know that came out recently, so that's what I'm talking about. Uh, a group that I haven't really talked about before, the Eagle Rock Gospel Singers. They've been coming out with a lot of new music lately, 
and uh, they're and they're working on a new album. So, uh, and uh, they're they're more Americana, folky, kind of gothic folk sort of. And uh, I've I've listened to a little bit of their music in the past, and now I've kind of just started listening to them again. And uh, yeah, I highly recommend them if you haven't. I'm I'm a little confused as to uh, about the their latest release because. According to Spotify, their latest single is I'll Be Reconciled, and that's the one that I'm recommending today. But just before I started the show, I went back on their social media, and they're like, ah, new single. Their latest post from, like, yesterday was like, ah, new single out called New Wine, and it's our first single from the new album. And I'm like, what? But I'll Be Reconciled, like, just came out. It came out after New Wine. So I don't know how I got confused about that maybe this song is going to be on the new album i don't know because apparently new wine was the first single for the album <laughs> and the and all the other singles are not going to be on the album i don't know i'm a little confused but either way this is the song that i'm reviewing and recommending i'll be reconciled it's basically just a good gospel song about being reconciled to christ after you know after all is said and done after we uh, go through all the things of this world, one of these, one day we will be finally reconciled to Christ, and it's just a really good, really good production. I love, I love the very you know gospel feel to it. Uh, a lot of you know good like vocals, background vocals. Uh, well, basically, it's basically a, a choir, you know. But it's it sounds really good. I'll be reconciled by all the Eagle Rock gospel singers. Check it out. All right, so a couple more, and uh, these last two, well, uh, hopefully two, um, I'm actually going to shout out some friends of mine uh, who we've talked about on the show before, and in fact, one of them is Benjamin Daniel, and he's been on the show before. He, uh, he's he been my first and only interview so far. I'd love to have other people on to, to interview, but... And uh, he was on my audio feed video. That's where I met him at Audio Feed Festival. And uh, he's working on a new album that will uh, be coming out soon. And this is his first single from the album. It's called Marrow. And, uh, oh, there was a... I was going to read the, the post that he made about it. Um, and, you know... We all here are, are big fans of, of Benjamin Daniel here. Singer, songwriter, you know, he's talked about how Andrew Peterson is a big inspiration for him. So if you like Andrew Peterson, you'll like this. And um, also this song features Sky Peterson, who she's a, a, a new up-and-coming artist, but she's like been making um, some good headway in her industry. Uh, she was on a she was recently featured on a Keith and, and Christian Getty song so like that's that's a pretty big deal it's a big deal for benjamin daniel and uh so marrow and he said in his uh recent post uh, it's about not beating yourself up when things get hard but going to the one who heals all wounds whether those wounds are inflicted by his, our circumstances or by or by our own selves or in my case often both uh so yeah and he has already shared and, and my conversation with him that this album is going to be very dark and, and emotional and it's about the passing of his mother. So, but Marrow is just a, it's a beautiful song, beautifully written, uh, it's a really good cello, uh, in there. And, uh, it's, a, and it's a good feature too with Sky Peterson. She does really well. And it, I don't know, it, it's just really beautiful and, and very moving. So I highly recommend you check it out. Marrow by Benjamin Daniel. As bone that couldn't pierce the bone to the marrow. Oh, oh, oh. All right. So uh, I'm sorry. Those are very short clips. Ten seconds. So I listen to the whole song. You know, I can't really play anymore, or else I'll get I'll get kicked off my platforms. You know. My last one I'm going to attempt to play for you is from my friend Corey from St. Pine Hills. 
he was also on my he was also on my audio feed festival uh, video and that's where I met him and we've stayed connected and he's been releasing some new music and he released a new single called Ballad of Julian Baker and uh, it's a good like uh, you know like indie rock song and it's basically about how for those of you who are not familiar with Julian Baker you know she writes a lot of like sad songs basically uh, and this song is just a just a honest song about how he wants to write songs like Julian Baker that are like, you know, very gut wrenching and can relate to hopefully relate to a lot of people. And yeah, I just like the, the bluntness and uh, honesty about the song. And it's also just like really uh, well made. And it's, uh, it's also really catchy. I had it stuck in my my head for. Uh, like the first day that I, I listened to it. So the thing is, is that he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't have, I couldn't find the song on, on YouTube. And that's usually how I, that's how I've been getting my clips to play on here. So I'm going to play it through Spotify and hopefully it should, uh, it should come through. Okay. But like, come on, Corey, like, why isn't your music on YouTube? Come on, man. <laughs> I mean, I guess I could like, download it from iTunes and such, but ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> but you guys should buy it on iTunes. I know it's on Bandcamp and such. It's definitely on Spotify. So here's a ballad of Julian Baker by Saint of Pine Hills. Okay, I think that was 10 seconds, so I wasn't paying attention. I was <laughs> kind of got lost in the song. <laughs> so, anyways, so that's uh, my humble opinion. It's back, guys, for now. And, uh, yeah, I think that should be that should be all. Although, th there was one thing that I, that I wanted to um, share with you guys, even though it's as little as possible. Um I, I just could be, I'm, I'm not going to like share any details or anything, but like I could just use some prayer right now, guys. Um, nah, I haven't been doing well in a lot of, in my personal life, just uh, with a lot of things going on in my life, it hasn't been great. And so... I, so yeah, I could use some prayer. Um, I'd appreciate it, um, to keep me in your thoughts and prayers. And, uh, hopefully this part of this episode will quickly become dated <laughs> because like, I'll come back to this episode and be like, oh wow. Yeah. I'm doing a lot better than I was then. So, but yeah, still, still, still being faithful, but I would appreciate it because, um, I appreciate the the support that you guys have, have given me so far. So yeah, I believe that prayer is a powerful thing, even though I don't know some of you guys, you know, so it's just, yeah, things going on in my life that I really could use some encouragement and uh provision from, from the Lord. So, so yeah, on that note, uh, thank you guys for for watching. Really appreciate it, and I think uh, I think that's that'll do it for. I don't know what accent I'm doing, but that that'll do it for today. Thanks, guys, for watching, listening to this episode of the I'm Clifford Today Show. Be sure to subscribe and leave a like. If you liked what you experienced today and also be sure to leave a comment, any feedback that you guys have, any questions, any answers, any comments or conundrums, I really appreciate it. Next episode, I really don't know what we're going to talk about, but um, we'll see. Always continuing to work on the, some of my other personal projects, my videos, uh, more about that later. 
Also, be sure to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. You can leave a rating on Spotify as well. And maybe on what other platform you guys listen to. I don't know. I'm just familiar with Spotify and Apple. Podwood Forecast. We just did our top 10 lists of 2022. And uh, we're working on another episode. So, yeah. Also, buy new merch. Link in the description. And uh, that should be it. I'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Maybe next week with my gaming channel. We'll see. No promises. But you guys have a good weekend. And I'll see y'all later.